Good afternoon, good evening or good morning to you all and welcome to our first webinar of the year. We're pleased to be kicking 2023 off with our resident EU financial services expert, Dr. David Doyle, who is joining us from Paris to provide us with his hotly anticipated update on the EU financial services regulatory agenda, including the future of access rules for non-EU financial services institutions, the powers and reach of the new EU anti-money laundering authority, and revisions to the MIFID and FMID regimes, including the delegation model for third country investment firms. David is known across Europe as a leading expert on EU financial services regulation. A former diplomat with over 20 years experience in mainland Europe, David now acts as an EU policy advisor. He is a board member and secretary to the Financial Services Working Party of the joint MEP EU industry advocacy body at the European Parliament and holds a seat on the board of directors at the Genesis Initiative at Westminster, promoting entrepreneurship and SME policy. Now, just briefly before we begin, I'm Charlotte Dobrashley, and it is my pleasure to manage the FS Club here at ZN. And I'd like to warmly acknowledge our very generous sponsors, who enable us to continue to bring you a wide range of thought-provoking content across finance, technology, and economics. The slides for this presentation are publicly available on our website and in the chat box. The session will be recorded and available to watch on our website within 48 hours. And we'll also be holding a 20-minute Q&A after the presentation. So please use the GoToWebinar chat facility to send your questions in to me, and then I will feed them into the conversation later on. Now that boring stuff is out of the way, I welcome you to take the virtual floor, David. Thank you, Charlotte, and uh, good day to you all, and a happy new year. Um, great to be back uh, briefing you so early in the year uh, about the uh, key uh, developments on the EU financial services regulatory agenda. Well, to listen to economists towards the end of last year, the prospects of the EU going into 2023 were overwhelmingly bleak, to say the least, with most of Europe uh, poised to go into the Bermuda Triangle of recession, high, higher unemployment and unrelentless um, uh, inflation. Hikes on the interest rates that have been introduced by the European Central Bank somewhat belatedly over the last year have only added to the woes of the higher borrowing cost factors, which affect adversely, of course, the European households and the already cash-strapped um, sovereign states in many parts of Southern Europe. The Central Bank in uh, Frankfurt raised its benchmark interest rate, as you know, on the 15th of December, uh, for the fourth time last year to 2.5%. At, uh, yeah, at a broader level, the head of the IMF, uh, Kristalina Georgieva, was to say somewhat ominously recently that the next 12 months are going to be even tougher again, she says, with expectations that a third of the world will experience some form of recession. But I have to say that in the first week of uh, this year, 2023, there's a lot of strong evidence suggesting that the EU economic uh, performance may not be as bad as it's being uh, painted. The Eurozone inflation, for instance, actually fell back to 9.2% in December after an annual price growth exceeding 10% over last year. And European gas prices are at levels last seen uh, just before the Russian invasion of Ukraine in February. But yet this slowdown in price inflation, or at least in early indications of this, may not be enough, in my view, to convince the European Central Bank to stop raising interest rates, at least not just yet. For the ECB to change its tack uh, interest uh, policy rate setters in, in Frankfurt will want to see some substantial falls in the core rates and other measures, particularly wage growth across the Eurozone in particular. All central banks, it has to be said, not just the European Central Bank, will be desperate to restore credibility by talking tough about fighting inflation going into this new year. Markets in Europe are already pricing a 50 basis points increase 
in the interest rates when the European Central Bank meets on the 2nd of February. But the ECB, like many of the other international regulators, are also tackling other issues besides high interest rates and their detrimental effect on the financial services sector. Issues like cryptocurrencies are a, a current issue, as is the sharp growth in so-called non-bank financial institutions. But this latter group in Europe now represents something like half of the global financial assets and remains a pretty unfamiliar territory for regulators and policymakers across the across the globe. So what are the main uh, features of the EU regulatory agenda going into 2023? Just very, very brief, um, broad terms. I guess one of the big issues that is being tackled quite assertively at the moment is large investment firms. And I spoke about the non-banking financial institutions, increasingly where banks are offloading traditional core banking services and it ends up in the hands of uh, investment firms, private equity insurers. But the investment firms are of a particular concern, at least in Europe. And we now have a situation in Europe where the ECB has imposed since um, July of last year a new licensing and a new supervisory regime for all systemically important uh, f uh, financial investment firms uh, which uh, indulge in particular in bank type activities like credit and market risk, dealing on their own account, underwriting and placing financial securities on a commitment basis. Now, this is going to be extended uh, increasingly as we go into 2023 to those investment firms that have a distinctly cross-border uh, nature and character to their business, uh, in, in addition to, of course, the handling of bank type of activities going forward. Secondly, sustainability risks and the disclosure regime. We now know that it's still work in progress. We now have nuclear energy and gas infrastructures that are considered to be acceptable taxonomy uh, elements going forward. And we are rolling out in Europe a disclosure regime, uh, both in terms uh, of the um, uh, taxonomy uh, regulation per se, which describes environmentally friendly ta uh, economic activities, but also the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, which discloses the sustainability information across the entire financial uh, value chain. Uh, chain. And not to be for forgotten is the, of course, uh, sustainable uh, finance disclosure uh, regulation uh, going forward as well. There are still um, big questions about interpretation. There's still concerns being expressed by industry which is being taken on board in terms of the lack of data, uh, the lack of um, uh, thresholds, the lack of consistency of uh, disclosures, which all need to be sorted out over the next uh, couple of months. Then we have revisions to the AFMD, MIFID usage regimes, and probably the most important thing that can be said here uh, is that we are aligning increasingly the disclosure regimes, the licensing, the authorization, the liquidity rules, uh, the delegation rules associated with all three of these important pieces of uh, legislation, all of which will move towards, I think, the AIFMD uh, much more robust system in terms of liquidity requirements and liquidity testing, but also in terms of delegation rules, but more about that later. The EU digital strategy, which has taken on a, perhaps a new dimensions since the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis. Um, we obviously have core part of this, the crypto asset uh, uh, regulation covering providers, uh, issuers, uh, exchanges, brokers, any financial uh, or indeed non-financial actor that's involved in any way in crypto assets is now picked up by the at least the European uh, uh, version of crypto asset uh, regulation. In fact, the European Union is very much leading the way 
compared to other major um, economic powers across Europe in terms of the uh, crypto asset regulatory field, all of which should be in place by early 2024. And there's also the um, operational resilience of uh, IT infrastructures and ITC infrastructures, which will also be uh, part of the uh, regime going forward. The worrying feature about some of this, of course, is that banks uh, have been somewhat slow in Europe in meeting the threat of fintechs who are now uh, increasingly encroaching in terms of the core banking services. Something like two-thirds uh, of all net uh, uh, income interest in the years ahead will be under threat on, from banks unless they start to look seriously at implementing and applying quickly uh, some of the blockchain uh, technology that's coming uh, through as well. Outer money laundering, yet another major game changer in my view. Uh, a new anti-money laundering agency will emerge in uh, at the very earliest in 2025, fully operational, fully funded, with massive powers of intervention, sanctioning, oversight of 40 plus um, uh, key financial institutions, not just within the Eurozone, but across the 27 uh, EU member states. And there is also a third country chapter that will deal with um, exchanges of information between the United Kingdom, the US, Japan, Brazil and elsewhere. But more about that later. Uh, and last but not least, the whole shift, I think, that we're seeing towards more strategic autonomy uh, at financial services regulatory level. In other words, reducing the over-reliance on non-financial institutions. Uh, now, what is being the major focus here has been on the U US dollar denominated transactions, something like 60% um, of the course of the central bank reserves are now held in US dollars. Uh, and, uh, you know, investors have been pouring into uh, US dollar denominated assets um, uh, since the uh, yields have gone up uh, late last year, which increases even further the prominence of US uh, dollar denominated uh, trading and clearing going into 2023. And in the FX markets themselves, you know, the US um, involvement is around about 90% of, of all uh, transactions. But clearly what we're looking at here uh, is also CCPs. Um, we're looking at the outcome of the Brexit uh, situation, which means that until uh, mid-2025, uh, uh, UK-based uh, clearinghouses will still be able to clear the majority of euro-denominated um, clearing FX and swap trades. And just recently, I think there was an explicit recognition by the Commission or the EU Commissioner McGuinness uh, as to uh, how she wishes to ensure a, uh, a orderly and timely and manageable uh, transition towards more and more clearing of uh, both US and uh, Euro-denominated uh, derivatives uh, in, on, on mainland Europe. But clearly the liquidity factors don't exist in great um, capacity, nor indeed does the institutional capacity itself. So therefore, the Commission has been calling upon all active uh, counterparties uh, to uh, who uh, uh, actively indulge in uh, um, clearing derivatives uh, across the European Union to open up active accounts with uh, European EU-based CCPs to ensure this uh, uh, this evolutionary rather than revolutionary shift towards uh, using CCPs. Quite clearly, this is not going to be a revolution. It's going to be an evolution going forward. So next slide, uh, please. Um, we'll talk a little bit now for, about this EU uh, strategic autonomy issue, probably the most important critical issue 
here is the change of pace and thinking and culture within the European Commission backed by the European uh, Council and the European Parliament in terms of how uh, the European Union wishes to manage, license, authorize, oversee third country bank branches going forward. Uh, up until very recently, up until 2019, and no doubt accentuated by Brexit, there were something like 110 separate uh, non-EU uh, bank branches uh, crossing something like um, 17 uh, foreign countries, seven of them being the most important, in, in excess of 600, uh, 500 uh, and 20 billion uh, euros of assets under management held by these branches, many of them holding very significant or risky assets, and perhaps more importantly and worryingly for the European Commission, many of these third country bank branches were also using the branches based in Ireland or Cyprus or Luxembourg or elsewhere to actually conduct activities on a cross-border basis, which is illegal. So the Commission has decided to call an end to this particular a laissez-faire type of approach. They've introduced a new third country regime for bank, third country banks, uh, which will be integrated into the Capital Requirements Directive version 6, which is due to come into place in 2025. They will be looking specifically at class one type um, third country branches that have assets in excess of 5 billion, but more importantly, systemically important third country bank branches that have assets both collectively and at an individual level uh, across the 27 new member states in excess of 40 billion euros to which the national competent authorities will have a growing uh, level of power discretionary powers to decide whether to uh, either force the individual third country bank uh, branches to be sub to be uh, subsidized, in other words, to be to hold capital and liquidity requirements uh, or a requirement within a short period of time to force these uh, third country bank branches to restructure their assets and liabilities so that they cease to be systemically important. In any event, we are heading towards capital endowment rules over that particular level for class one type um, third country bank branches, 4% uh, of branches average liabilities, class two, which is those which fall below the 5 billion uh, uh, level of, um, of assets under management, 1% uh, of the average uh, liabilities. Uh, on, on top of that, we will have the introduction of liquidity rules, which will uh, require third country bank branches to deposit liquidity assets uh, to escrow accounts for security for purely resolution purposes, not for the purposes of uh, risk uh, per se. Next slide, please. Um, the other important uh, feature which took a in incredible and almost a disproportionate amount of time to negotiate between the European Parliament and the Council was this famous question of what core banking activities now mandatorily require the creation of a third country bank branch. The situation we're moving towards is that there will be no case where or at least essentially no uh, excuses for continuing to, for a third country to provide banking services of any nature uh, to uh, any of the 27 EU member states individually or collectively from a remote base, whether it's New York uh, uh, or, or, or Tokyo or, or London. The vast bulk of core banking services that are listed on the right hand side of this particular chart uh, taking deposits, um, consumer credit, uh, uh, factoring, uh, financing of commercial transactions, guarantees, commitments, and in particular, uh, lending to EU uh, corporates will now only be possible if there is a third country bank branch set up, licensed, authorized uh, 
uh, to do so. And clearly, we are moving towards a situation where existing third country bank branches or foreign banks will have to reapply for authorization uh, and be, have to provide some very detailed disclosures uh, going forward uh, in terms of uh, the, the value of their assets, how they manage these uh, delegation of activities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There are two exemptions, uh, happily, which were negotiated in extremis. The first relates to reverse solicitation when contracting with all categories of uh, clients, particularly under the MIFID regime, and that includes retail clients as well as professional clients, and also MIFID ancillary services have also been excluded from this particular rule. In other words, for the bulk of MIFID-related activities, uh, one can, under certain circumstances, continue to provide those services from a remote uh, base uh, going forward. And I have to say that this is not just about third country uh, banks per se. The same rules apply to third country investment firms whether they be subsidiaries or whether they be branches. Next slide, uh, please. Um, so uh, clearly, uh, the the national public authorities are, are not actually uh, the European Central Bank. I think there was the expectation, as I mentioned on my last um, on my last presentation to you all uh, this time last year. The expectation then, I think, was uh, maybe it'll fall to the European Central Bank, who will have the powers, discretionary powers, to be able to oversee not just third country bank subsidiaries over 40 billion uh, euros, but also uh, third country bank branches. That is not going to uh, materialize visibly, at least for the moment, for the next five years. We're looking at national property authorities having the discretionary powers up to a certain level to be able to decide whether certain bank, third country bank branches, uh, A, they need to be licensed, B, they need to be authorized, C, they need to be more supervised, more rigorously, and in, in particular, they will be banned, prohibited from providing core banking services or ancillary services from a branch in Finland or Cyprus to other parts of the uh, European Union. But clearly, in order to be able to police this, uh, and we're still at very early stages, the national competent authorities will be given powers to seek information from the third country bank uh, branch, uh, branches uh, individually in terms of uh, how systemic they are, whether they pose a particular significant risk uh, to the EU st state of establishment, the size of that particular um, branch, the type of business, the degree of interconnectivity with other parts of the financial services, uh, as it were, infrastructure, private equity, insurers, uh, hedge funds, etc. Uh, the substitutability, in other words, to, to what degree should that branch fail, can the activities be substituted by another existing perhaps third country or existing national uh, branch uh, activity. And the likely impact of suspension or closure of that branch in terms of clearing settlement uh, payment systems in that specific uh, country of uh, establishment. This is pretty important. We're talking about in excess of 520 billion euros of assets uh, and transactions held by third country bank branches across the EU, according to statistics provided by the uh, European Commission. Next slide, please. Uh, now, the new LM authority, uh, a game changer, as I've mentioned on many occasions. It will see after many decades of sheer frustration by the European Commission, by the national regulators, by member states of money laundering scandals practically in every country in Europe, the fact that many of the national competent authorities lacked the institutional capacity and indeed uh, the, the enforcement ability, as did the EBA, to be able to police and oversee what was increasingly a cross-border type activity. 
We're now moving towards a higher level of supervisory oversight, the creation of a new EU AML agency. We don't know where that's going to be based for the moment, but it'll be something similar to the ECB with massive powers of supervision, authorization, intervention that can force financial institutions to change radically uh, their AML uh, policy and ensure full compliance with all of the anti-money laundering directives up to now. So they'd be extending these powers also to the private sector, although not directly, but at least they will oversee the rules that can, are conducted by national regulators in energy, commodities, uh, and so on, telecoms. It will also introduce new measures for third countries, uh, where the AML CFT policies are perceived as being a risk to the EU financial stability of the EU. That is to say, where those financial institutions are based in London, New York, uh, Beijing or elsewhere that have a magnitude of activities of, of a certain um, scale where the anti-money laundering uh, measures are not sufficiently robust enough. There will be a new memorandum of understanding, uh, exchanges of information foreseen between this new AML agency and third country uh, regulators going forward. Now, what are the key uh, what are the key sort of characteristics in terms of uh, profile, at least initially, of those EU uh, entities, and indeed even third country entities, which will be directly supervised by this new uh, AML agency? Well, we're looking at credit institutions for obvious reasons, banks. 72% of all money laundering uh, uh, prices have emerged from the banking sector over the last decade. So clearly that's going to be a, a very important priority going forward. But also Bureau de Change, uh, usage uh, firms, credit providers other than credit uh, institutions. And here, you know, we're looking at crowdfunding, we're even looking at insurers, uh, private equity, uh, investment firms that are increasingly in this space e-money institutions, investment firms over a certain size, and in particular, if they have cross-border activities, payment service providers, life insurers, and reassurers. And interestingly, for the first time, the notion that crypto asset service providers, whatever, wherever they are based in terms of the EU activities, and they have to have an EU presence, they will be directly supervised by this new EU AML agency going forward. In terms of specific attention, at least on the early stages, uh, those high-risk cross-border banks and financial institutions with activities in a significant number of member states will be prominent in terms of the uh, in terms of being chosen as a direct supervisory entity, a bit like the ECB. In exceptional cases, any entity who's serious systemic or systematic and repeated breaches of applicable anti-money laundering requirements has come to the notice of the regulators will also be given special attention and they will directly supervise at least one financial entity in each EU member state going forward. So huge implications here uh, in terms of at least 40 plus financial entities uh, across the 27 EU member states and an indirect form, as it were, of uh, supervisory oversight via the national company authorities, but under the auspices of this new agency. One last point, the EBA will, and indeed the national company authorities, will pretty much lose their uh, discretionary powers when it comes to those 40 plus uh, entities. It will fall to this new agency uh, going forward. Next slide, please. Um, sorry to interrupt you there, David. Well, we've yeah. got some great questions, lots of great questions, so we'll need to move on to them now, if that's okay. Okay, by all means. So I'll try and conclude quickly. Thank you, Charlotte. So next um, next slide, please, and then we'll try and conclude. I think probably the most important message I have to give you here is in terms of the, and this is important too, in terms of the United Kingdom, uh, there was a threat, you may recall, going back to 2017, where the EU envisaged to actually banning, prohibiting any form of delegated activities, particularly risk management and portfolio management, where the investment firm 
systematically and at a major level of magnitude delegated many of these activities back to, to London, New York, uh, Tokyo, or elsewhere. The good news uh, is that the Commission, uh, backed by the European Council and the European Parliament, have decided to maintain the delegation model, particularly in relation to portfolio management and risk to third countries, but there will be more prescriptive disclosures required by national competent authorities in terms of the continuity rather than reapplying for uh, uh, authorization to continue uh, to delegate, but there will be a long list of requirements on a yearly basis in terms of description of the delegated activities, the information about the delegates, performance of delegation, uh, the percentage of uh, assets delegated on portfolio management, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There will be a further a requirement to hire at least a minimum of two persons on a full-time basis uh, to be resident in the EU uh, for those uh, third country uh, investment firms that wish to continue to delegate back to uh, some third country capital. They will still be obliged to have in residence in Frankfurt, Paris, wherever, uh, two uh, resident people uh, actually managing the substance of these activities going forward. I should mention, by the way, all these slides will be available to those uh, after this presentation if you wish to catch up. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so, crypto assets, what can we say, what can we not say, given the crisis we've had with the FTX collapse and so on? Well, we are now looking at a very comprehensive piece of legislation uh, in, uh, in Europe, which will uh, essentially, unlike in the United Kingdom, the US, Japan, or even other jurisdictions like China, India, Thailand, South Africa, Singapore, that have actually banned uh, crypto asset uh, providing uh, service providers. Uh, here, we're not moving towards a ban, of such uh, activities, but a much more robust licensing, authorization, and a sort of a mini capital requirements type of approach to any uh, issuer or provider that wishes to uh, do business in crypto assets in Europe. There will be a, a residency requirements. Um, sorry to interrupt, David. Yeah. We've only got about 10 minutes left, and we do have a lot of questions. So is Bye. it okay if we move on to them now? Uh, Okay, by, by all means, let's do so. Thank you. Um, okay, so Hugh Simpson has asked, what progress do you expect to see on CMU this year? Uh, well, we're, we've already seen um, a, a number of uh, measures announced just before Christmas. Uh, new rules are on, um, are on strengthening the insolvency rules uh, in Europe while well, strengthening in the sense that it's going to be easier for companies to go into liquidation, uh, make them more attractive to potential buyers, uh, and also providing more information uh, of a financial nature to those potential buyers going forward. So we are reaching, I think, a, a stage at long last where insolvency regulation in Europe, which has always been very, very overregulated under the civil law, uh, uh, type uh, regime will be loosened and there will be much more uh, capacity to alleviate many of these companies from the burdens they've had to face in the past, go into liquidation uh, and, and then move on simply by liquidating the company or by selling uh, the remaining, remaining assets. The other area that of CMU that is important is, as I mentioned this already, uh, is a is a evolutionary approach towards euro denominated clearing of derivatives in Europe before um, uh, July 2025, when this uh, temporary equivalency regime uh, will finish for the use of UK-based CCPs. Uh, there won't be a sudden cliff-facing situation. There will be an evolutionary move towards allowing counterparties to actually open up active accounts with uh, EU-based CCPs and, and moving gradually towards a shift in euro-denominated uh, swaps uh, to Europe. But it's not going to be a big bang situation, uh, which was feared 
previously, and, and perhaps more importantly, I, in terms of the CMU, there was a problem, uh, or there was at least a concern, that this could lead to many clearing and even trading of derivative activities shifting to other jurisdictions like the US or Singapore or elsewhere. Uh, and on other areas, um, the CMU has also and is going to continue uh, to introduce um, revisions and simplifications and deregulation of vast parts of the Mithras and Mithia regime. We keep talking about the UK deregulating, but actually the European Commission has uh, beaten the UK to beyond the the the, uh, the winning post in terms of introducing some very significant uh, reductions in disclosure, the disclosure regime, best execution, for instance, which has been um, suspended, but also now disclosure rules, particularly in relation to uh, eligible counterparties and uh, and to professional investors going forward. Next question, please. Uh, Byron Fries asked, do you feel the lack of liquidity and infrastructure in the euro area relative to the UK could prove an opportunity for unclear decentralised finance to be adopted at a faster pace? Uh, no, I don't think I don't think it's a question necessarily of liquidity. It's a question of the banks seizing uh, a little bit more assertively um, the decentralised and blockchain technology. They haven't been doing so uh, assertively enough, uh, which means that they really do risk in the next couple of years. And there was a study done by this only last week, and I quote um, from uh, Medio Banca, which showed that their analysis uh, of standardized products would be prone to disruption at 12 of the largest banks in Europe if there isn't a more uh, a wholesale adoption of blockchain and decentralized um, technologies, particularly in relation to um, uh, many of the banks, uh, uh, you know, core uh, banking services, uh, which are likely to suffer from you know, uh, further infiltration by fintechs who are increasingly taking a, a massive role here. Uh, now, to, to say that the Commission is not aware of this is it would would be, I think, uh, would be erroneous on my part. They are moving cautiously towards pilot schemes of blockchain and decentralized uh, technologies. They are using a pilot scheme to test this over the next year. And only then, maybe in 2024, 2025, will we see the um, uh, the release uh, uh, and uh, uh, and move towards a blockchain decentralized uh, regulatory agenda. But we're not quite there yet. But in the meantime, it's a very I think it's a very vulnerable period for many of the banks in this space. On um, blockchain, Ian Sheridan has asked. What evidence is there that blockchain technology is important going forward, as there are already trusted third-party trading platforms that execute trades in seconds using already established technologies? Uh, yeah, yes, that, that's, that's true, but um, a lot of this lacks, uh, as, we're, as we discovered with the, the, the crypto asset um, crisis, a lot of this lacks the regulatory uh, framework, uh, which, as I've said already, is still at a very embryonic stage. And I think what worries the regulators in Europe uh, more than anything is that as long as these uh, decentralized blockchain type activities are taking place outside of the realm of the EU regulatory supervisory framework, that is a sustainability, um, a, st a stability risk factor uh, for the financial services institutions going into 2023. So, what's lacking at the moment, I think, is a is a comprehensive um, uh, a comprehensive uh, regulatory framework. I think there's a, I think there's a very healthy recognition that we need that Europe needs to embrace all of this uh, quickly. As an innovativeness factor to reduce costs, to enable banks to provide uh, services faster, cheaper uh, to the markets, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, 
Okay, and Dan Feeney's asked if you can provide an update from the European Payment Council's EPI scheme in relation to the EU digital identity and instant SEPA. Well, that's one of the three or four uh, key prominent um, pillars of the EU digital strategy that was devised and issued in June, June, July 2021. Um, it, 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 what has taken prominence over that particular aspect, of course, is the crypto asset um, uh, markets regulation combined with the uh, operational resilience uh, directive. They were the two key priorities going forward for very obvious reasons, as we, as we discovered towards the end of last year. Uh, but that's not to say that they would not be given more prominence going into 2023. There is indeed uh, uh, a work program that is foreseen by the European Commission in terms of um, ID, uh, digital IDs, which would which have the potential to be rolled out across Europe and would in, engage all of the banking financial services institutions in making uh, it easier for citizens in Europe to be able to invest across frontiers. Part of the problem we face in Europe is that less than 3% of EU citizens actually invest beyond their own, front, their own national frontiers. Part of the reason for this is the, is the lack of a mechanism that allows people to be identified by other financial institutions uh, when it comes to investing across borders. And that's where the digital ID in the financial services sector comes into place. What, what's holding it back as well, I guess, is, is the anti-money laundering dimension that has to be uh, built into this uh, digital ID, uh, as it were, mechanism. We're not quite there yet. And again, that is being overtaken by the concern and the priority to make sure that we have this EU anti-money laundering, uh, as it were, um, uh, body set up, which will oversee, by the way, as one of our eight or ten um, uh, entities, uh, e-payment uh, providers going forward. But So there is still a lot of work to be done by the Commission on this. Okay, I think that actually just um, that last part just answered Bob McDowell's question, which was why it was thought necessary to set up a new AML authority and whether mm. it replaced or subsumed any existing regulatory yeah. body. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it will replace, I'll be clear about this, it will replace national competent authorities uh, in those EU member states, particularly the, but not just the large one, but even small to medium sized states where a financial institution has a prominent role, it has a massive, as it were, influence, a significant footprint in vis-a-vis uh, -vis the GDP of, the, of that country. Some of these small uh, EU member states have only two or three banks, which are very significant. If any one of them were to fail, of course, you know, they would have major financial implications economically as well. But from an anti-money laundering perspective, this new agency will be stepping in removing the discretionary powers of national public authorities specifically for those uh, categories of financial institutions that represent a threat to financial stability, as well um, as uh, removing uh, the role traditionally played by the EBA, the European Banking Authority, and very specifically in the, uh, in the text, the regulation. It stands out like a sore thumb. Uh, the EBA's role as overseeing as it were, uh, the compliance of national company authorities in terms of compliance with anti-money laundering directors will be removed and it will be given to uh, this new uh, EU, uh, EU AML agency going forward. I think uh, this is a good question um, to finish on. Clive Bullins asked, are these EU regulatory changes good or bad for London as a financial centre? Um, so some of them are, 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 well, two things. One, I think, as I've said already, um, the UK and the EU have embarked uh, at different paces of speed in terms of deregulating um, the financial services regulatory agenda, notably in the area of MIFID. I think we're going to see much more um, going forward in terms of the AFMD. 
and the uses, um, uh, uses regulations as well. As to whether they are aligned, perhaps not entirely, but I think the general focus at the moment is, is to remove the, uh, some of the more um, heavyweight onerous burdens in terms of disclosure where both the EU and the UK are heading pretty much in the same direction. Elsewhere, um, I, you know, I have to say that, you know, the big elephant in the room is that we have not yet signed, the UK and the EU have yet to sign this memorandum of understanding in terms of the financial services regulatory uh, agenda going forward. This, this was to foresee the creation of a task force um, comprised of both the UK regulators and e-regulators that would look at upstream at, you know, at some of the issues uh, coming down the pipeline to avoid duplication, regulatory arbitrage uh, and nuclear solutions that could be uh, adopted by one side or the other. So that, that is a bit of a, that is a, a, a risk factor in my view. On the other hand, you know, it has to be said that many of the key uh, flagship pieces of regulation, whether it be in derivatives, uh, capital requirements, uh, uh, in insurance, um, the digital uh, the digital data uh, agenda, but even more recently, uh, uh, the crypto asset agenda. Increasingly, I think the UK is relying on its continuing membership uh, to the FSB, the Financial Services. Uh, uh, board, uh, IOSCO, the Basel Committee, which set the broad framework under which the EU regulatory authority, that is to say the European Commission, uh, acts upon uh, going forward. And, you know, I don't see the UK deviating, diverging significantly from the broader, as it were, uh, FSB stroke, BIS stroke, IOSCO uh, deliberations going forward. There will be some areas where the UK uh, perhaps wisely has decided to deviate from parts of MIFID, maybe maybe also on, on sovereignty too, but in broad terms I don't see uh, advantages accruing to either uh, the European Union or the United Kingdom going forward. I think there's sort of a re relatively sanguine sense in Brussels that we need to continue working with all of the international financial centres that are important in terms of providing the necessary wholesale funding, uh, trading and clearing of derivatives going forward until such time as the EU can build up that capacity and the liquidity to be able to uh, compete uh, with the major players going forward. Thank you very much, David. It was lovely to speak to you again. And as usual, you've provided a very thorough and useful presentation. And also thanks to our wonderful sponsors for making these webinars possible. And equally important, thank you to um, our intelligent audience for your time and contributions today. I do apologize if we didn't get to your question, but it will be sent directly to David so he can get in touch with you via email. And also don't forget to check out our forthcoming events on our website. We're starting the new year as we plan to go on with lots of diverse thought-provoking content from cracking down on greenwashing tomorrow afternoon to the suspenseful what does Xi Jinping want for his country on Wednesday and coming up next week, the curious economics of authenticity and the surprising power of ideas that don't make sense. Thanks for your time today and apologies for running over a bit there and wishing you all a successful and happy new year ahead. Thank you.